Christ community. We're so glad you're here. We'd love it if y'all would stand and sing this with us. Let's sing the Lord's Prayer together. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Sing that again. Father, let your kingdom come. Becky Clark, and I'm the executive director here at Christ Community. It is a gorgeous day outside, and it is made more beautiful by the fact that you chose to be here with us this morning. So we are so glad that you're here. If you're a guest with us this morning, I'd like to call your attention to the worship guide, which will help you to um, navigate the service and learn a little bit more about us and what's happening here. There's even a QR code inside where you can check in and let us know that you're visiting. Or you can stop by the welcome desk in the front where there's a friendly staff member who'd like to meet you. If you're a regular around here and you have a question about something that's happening, you can also stop by the welcome desk. The staff member there would be happy to help you with any questions you might have as well. Regardless of whether you're a guest or a regular attender, our hope for you this morning is that you'll have an opportunity to see God's kingdom and to better understand and know the goodness of our King. Would you stand and join me for our call to worship from Psalm 30? Oh, Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, 
but joy comes with the morning. Let's pray. Jesus, we are grateful that we can gather as a community of people who have been healed by you. Thank you for bringing us out of the darkness where we were slaves to self and bringing us into the light of life in your kingdom. Through your spirit, equip us to worship you now as we will worship you for eternity. Amen. Let's sing. Let's continue to sing and worship. Rumors of the Son of Man Stories of a Savior
the strong and perfect plea a great high priest whose name is love whoever lives and
awesome and great are you, Lord. Beauty beyond compare. Love and mercy beyond comprehension. Father, cover us. Cover us with your wings. Cover us in the day of war. Cover us in the day of strife. Cover us, Father. Give us peace. We need you, God. Oh, we need you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your presence, the Holy Spirit that resides within us, God. Thank you. We love you. We adore you. And we praise your name. We ask that you bless us and keep us and make your face shine upon us and give us peace, God. We ask all these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, at this time, kiddos kindergarten through second grade are now dismissed to small saints right over here in this corner following the sign. And for the rest of us while they're exiting, let's go ahead and turn to your neighbor and pass the peace. Becky's going to do that. Good morning. A peace of Christ with you. I'm learning. See, Randy's modeled well for me, the new guy. Uh, good morning. My name is Greg. I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here, and uh, it's a, just a beautiful morning. I'm glad that you are all here listening on live stream or home, or if you're traveling, welcome. Uh, so glad that you are with us this morning. Um, we are, uh, my wife and I began serving here in October, uh, and we are just so delighted to be here. If I have not met you yet, uh, just come up after service. Just love to, to meet you. Um, and just to know how we can serve you. Uh, and we just want to say also thank you for being so warm and welcoming to my family and to um, my wife and to, to me. So we just want to say thank you. And it is a beautiful privilege to serve here. We are um, continuing in our sermon series from the Gospel of Luke into the book of Acts, um, which is really the second, it's a two volume book. That the, the author, historian, physician Luke wrote. Um, he was the traveling companion of Paul for about, and he wrote Luke in the early 60 AD, and then he wrote it about 10 years later. So Luke was first, Acts was second, and there's just this theme of a continuation um, where the story just continues. The death and resurrection of Jesus happens as historical fact, and there's more. Um, it's just like the storyline is like what a sequel does to a good movie, right? Um, there's the same storyline continues, but there's new characters, there's a new setting, um, there's a new enemy introduced, but the same story and the message of Jesus in the gospel just continues. Like what the Empire Strikes Back did to Star Wars, right? It's just a difference, it's a different... It's the same story, just different continuation, same continuation. And we begin today with Acts verses 1 through 11, uh, verses that introduce that Jesus is now continuing his ministry, and he's manifesting it in a very different way. So this is Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. This is the word of God. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. And he appeared to them over a period of 40 days 
and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we give you great praise for your word, how it strengthens, it convicts, it heals, it restores, all because of your spirit is present with us. And Father, we ask, be with your people. Right now, I ask that you would open up and ask a prayer, say a prayer for your own heart to be opened for what the Lord may have for you this morning. Pray for your neighbor. Pray for the preacher. And Jesus, we ask all this in your mighty, holy and resurrected name. Amen. So Acts, like we said, it's the perfect continuation because it records the next steps. So if you remind, uh, remember with me, in Luke's gospel, Jesus had accomplished redemption. The gospel ends because Jesus had resurrected from the grave. Here in Acts, he's organizing a band of brothers of misfits to send out to communicate the message of redemption. In Luke's gospel... Uh, Jesus was resurrected. Now we see him being ascended into heaven. Uh, we see Jesus and Luke uh, sowing the seeds for Christianity. Now in, in, in Acts, we see Christianity growing and expanding. It's really the kingdom of God is beginning to advance. After all, Jesus was preaching he was teaching and he was healing. He was praying. All his, his three-year ministry, what was he doing with his disciples? He was training them. The word that we would use would be he was discipling them to carry on this, myth, this message. And let me ask you a question. Do you think the disciples were ready? Would you be ready to carry on this message? Just days prior to the lives of these disciples, remember, they had nothing to do with Jesus. They ran. He was being crucified, and they ran when they were said, aren't you the followers of Jesus? Right? So a little grace and empathy for the disciples here. Who would be ready for this mission, this, this, uh, mission that they were about to be given? I mean, they were no more prepared than I would be for you students who are taking the TCAP exams this week. Right? I mean, I have a daughter studying for that, right? There's third through eighth graders. Like, y'all would do so much better because you've been studying. You've been prepared, right? You've been equipped, right? So although the disciples, they knew Jesus for three years, they, they didn't know what was about to happen. Yet Jesus did. I mean, think about this, for example, right? So you're at work, and your boss comes into your office and says, Hey, I want you to run the office. I want you to do my job. I'm going to Maui, and I'm going to plug in remotely there forever. Right? Can you do my job for me and your job? 
Right? And you may, in your graciousness, you may something, say something of like, I mean, I, I need a little help. I need some resources. Like, I need, I need whatever you have. I need your help. I need training. I need some commit. Like, what are you asking me to do? I need some help. I can't do this in my own strength. And that's what Jesus does for the disciples. He provides the purposes. He provides exactly what the disciples need. And there's three things that he provides in this, these 11 verses. His spirit, his people, and his return. That's what he promises. He promises to pour out his spirit. He promises to commission his people. And he promises to return. And that's how Christianity and the kingdom of God has advanced for 2,000 years until Jesus comes back. Okay, so let's walk through this story together. Verses 1 through 5. Before Jesus gives his spirit, verses 1 and 2, he reminds us, Theophilus, who is the intended recipient of this letter, he says, uh, I wrote to you earlier in my Gospel of Luke everything that Jesus began to do and to teach. He's reminding them there is a message of Christianity. Before you just start going and doing, right? You have to know the message. He performed miracles he, he, uh, to strengthen their faith. He taught parables. He taught about the kingdom of God. And Luke is reminding Theophilus what Jesus did to the disciples and was to you and me this morning, there is a message of Christianity that we must understand and embrace before we can testify to it. And we believe, you may understand the gospel. I mean, even some self-proclaimed atheists understand the gospel message. It has to be embraced. It has to be received believed it's not just a rational acceptance the core message of christianity part of it is it's a change of heart it's a change of the deepest part of of who you are the messenger must first know the message robert murray mcshane he's a 19th century scottish preacher he gave these following words of counsel to a young aspiring minister he said this, he said, do not forget the culture of your own heart because you are God's chosen instrument to bear the name of Jesus. And God does not bless the perfection of that instrument so much as he blesses the desire to live the message of his son. It's not about our behavior. It's not about our words. It's about our hearts first and foremost, being open to the power of God's grace. Personal example, okay? I used to memorize scripture as a young Christian. I came to know the Lord around 24, and I just thought what you did was just memorize scripture, right? Just memorize scripture, right? For years, I had all the scriptures on the dashboard of my car, Hoping that when someone got in, they would see all the scriptures that I had memorized. Because it says, memorize scriptures. <laughs> right? It's humiliating to look back. But that's what I did. I just thought, <laughs> you just memorized scripture. And guess what? I mean, it was practical Phariseeism. I was looking for applause. I was looking for validation of saying, Look at all the knowledge that I know. None of it affected my heart. None of it. Because I forgot them. Right? It was a performance. It was a thing. I knew I had embraced the message of grace. I was just living it completely different. Which means the message hadn't penetrated my heart yet. I had belief. And I believe that the grace of God was changing my heart through that. So what is the core message of Christianity? 2 Corinthians 5 is a good place to start. There are many other verses, but just to introduce one, 2 Corinthians 5. Let me read this for us. Now all things come from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ 
and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to, the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, as he is committing to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. And we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Because God made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The core message of Christianity is God rescuing you and me in the fallen, broken human heart into a restored, loving relationship with God the Father through the work of Jesus Christ. It's reconciliation, it's rescue, it's redemption for restoration of all things. Have you met, have you embraced this message of grace? Are you just memorizing scripture like I was? Because that's the right thing to do. The disciples needed not only the proper message, but they also needed the confidence to go proclaim the message. Verse 3, Jesus, what's he do? He just reveals himself. He shows up in the flesh, resurrected body in the flesh, and he shows up. Luke says for over 40 days, he lived and he taught and he breathed and the disciples touched him and he taught about what? The kingdom of God. And when Luke wrote of these convincing proofs, he was saying, I'm going to start spreading the, the, the charts of Christianity advancing, but you need to know, reader, listener, man, woman, child here this morning, that Jesus actually rose from the grave. It's a historical fact. That's the confidence that the disciples would need. They would have a hard time witnessing to a dead Jesus. But a resurrected Jesus, now that'll light their hair on fire. They can get behind that. And Jesus knew that. See, the death and resurrection of Jesus are like, explained to me once, they're like two wings of an aircraft, right? One wing of the aircraft represents the cross, the victory that was won for you that you could not win for yourself. Jesus was your substitute. He was the covering for the penalty of your sin. By God's grace, you believe that message through faith alone, you will be saved. And you will have a transformation of heart and life. The other wing is the resurrection. Right? Jesus took upon the penalty for our sin and actually gave us the righteousness. Through the resurrection, Paul says... Our justification is powerful. Our declared righteousness happens because of the resurrection. And if Christ didn't raise from the dead, guess what? This preaching is futile. Our faith is dead. And there is no way to receive righteousness from God. It all hinges on the resurrection. And if you just have one of those planes, one of those wings, the aircraft will crash. It's the death and the resurrection of Jesus. That's the message. And that's why Jesus showed up and manifested himself. In verses 4 and 5, then he says, Jesus is, well, we know Jesus' body is now been resur- has been ascended to heaven. His presence is no longer physical. On this earth, it's spiritual. Verses 4 and 5, he says, Wait for the gift of my Father, promised, which you have heard me speak about. He's referencing there in in verse 4, I've already told you I must go to heaven. I must ascend so the Father can send the Holy Spirit. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So having received the message after receiving the witness account of Jesus in the flesh, 
they might have been ready to just minister in their own strength. Can anyone relate with that? I can. Where it's up to me. I have to go do this. I have to have the right Romans road memorized. I have to have the right Bible knowledge. I have to have the right spiritual practices. I have to have... Maybe you think that you can witness about grace in your own strength. And let me just tell you, the Holy Spirit is going before you. And He is with you. So to prevent the error of the disciples of ministering in their own strength, He says the Holy Spirit is coming. And that's what Randy will preach about next week, the Pentecost. Hear Jesus saying, I will promise it will come. And it comes ten days later. Remember with me the heart of all Old Testament prophecy, okay? Ezekiel 36. It's the promise of a new heart. Ezekiel prophesies that God will gather all of his people from all of the nations, and he will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. He will remove from you your heart of stone, and he will give you a heart of flesh. And he will put his spirit in you and move you to follow his word and to obey his word. It's fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. That Jesus must ascend so the spirit can come and do the work to advance the kingdom of God. So Jesus makes provision for his kingdom to advance through his spirit. It's coming, the disciples Verses 6 through 8, he makes provision for how the kingdom will advance through his people. So he commissions his disciples. They gathered around him in verse 6, and they asked him this question, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Not of Israel, to Israel. Remember that. Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. The disciples, they still have this really complex, profound misunderstanding of what kingdom is coming. Based on that question. Right? They're still looking for a political kingdom. After all these <laughs> time, they're still looking for an earthly kingdom to be, in, to be inaugurated. Just like the time of David, which was the pinnacle of Israel's blessedness on the earth they're also looking for a Jewish only kingdom they wanted their kingdom to be installed in Israel and they also wanted a a kingdom just to honor Israel it was just about them that's all they were after give us our kingdom you're our king yes and after all this time Jesus doesn't say he doesn't chide them he doesn't criticize them You know what he says? I have a different mission for you. It's so kind. He says, my father's business is not your business. In the meantime, carry and continue my message of redemption, of reconciliation, and restoration to the nations. In verse 8, Jesus, he goes on to describe what is his kingdom. First, it's spiritual because it's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come. So God's kingdom is spiritual. What's your reaction when you hear that? Spiritual. Right? We live in the post-enlightenment era where reason trumps mystery. You know, we can rationalize everything, but if we can't see it, it must not be real. Right, that's just, that's just, for 1800 years, like, you know, we just believe the mystery of faith is a mystery. But when we hear spiritual, do you, like me, sometimes just think, if I can't see it, it just must not exist? Right, it's like culture. We can't see culture, but it's around us everywhere we go. It's like oxygen. You can't live without it. Right? But it's available everywhere you go by the grace of God. And what Jesus actually says is that my kingdom 
is spiritual. It's a kingdom of God. Disciples, it's not your kingdom. It's my kingdom. It's not political. It's not for you. And it's actually for the nations. And you're going to take it with my spirit. Now, John Stott has been really helpful. I love his writings. He defines the kingdom of God this way. God's reigning over God's people in all of God's places. That's always really helped me, the clarity, the simplicity of that. It's God's reign over God's people in all of God's, all of God's places. And if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, you already believe a mustard seed that there is an invisible kingdom of God. We can't see it, but it's like faith. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Right? You can't see faith, but you see, when you know it, when you see it, when it's in action. You can't see love, but you feel it when you're being loved. That's what the kingdom of God is like. Verse 8, he also says, the kingdom of God is powerful. This word power, it literally means like dynamite, explosion. It's shattering. It's the old, tearing down the old to build up and bring the new. Right? It's life-changing. Jesus is saying change, renewal, transformation, it comes from God, from the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit uses the grace of God to revive fallen, sinful men and women, bringing them to repentance for sin, and embarking on a lifetime of learning the word, ways, and work of Jesus to fall more in love with God and people, that's living in the kingdom of God now. Living in the kingdom, it's not when we die and go to heaven. There's a kingdom currency right here, and it's powered by God's grace, and we get to testify to it, and we get to live it. As one theologian says, we get to practice here and now living in the kingdom of God as the witnesses of Jesus. That's the honor of being a Christ follower. Finally, in, in, in the second half of verse 8, he says it's a kingdom of truth because you're going to be my witnesses. The word witness comes from the word wit, right? It means to know. We use the word witty. That person's well, they're wit, they're witful, right? It means someone's quick on the draw with their knowledge and they're actually willing to to give their knowledge. They're willing to testify to it. They just don't hold it for themselves. They give it away. That's why when you get called to court, you have to testify. You're obligated to give away what you, heard, what you heard, what you saw, what you experienced. That's the beauty. That's the invitation that the Lord has for his church and for you and me. John Newton said, Christ has taken our nature into heaven to represent us. And he has left us on earth with his nature to represent him. As he ascends, part of us ascends with him, the hope of our hearts. But he left us, his spirit, to testify about him in the meantime. And you know what happens when you testify? When you witness, when you just live your life in front of people? Revelation says... People overcame the tactics of the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the testimony of the saints. It's both and. It's the power of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, and it's the testimony of the saints. That's what disarms Satan and his tactics and his divisive plots that that Jesus said he came to steal, kill, and destroy. Guess what? He has a vested interest on his church not expanding the kingdom of God into a world that needs it. And we're to testify to it as a church, not just preaching what Randy does, what I do. Like, it's everywhere in your life. It's not just for two hours on a Sunday. It's all of life. And you may say, I I have a stuttering issue. Well, that's okay. The Holy Spirit doesn't. He'll give you exactly the right words and countenance. And you may say, I don't know all of Scripture. I don't know Romans Road. I don't know. Guess what? The Holy Spirit does. You show up. You say, I don't know what to say. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will give you testimony to give on his behalf. 
There's a, there's a gentle invitation for his church to say, God, how can I witness for you and come and do it by the power of your spirit? It's not up to you, but we get to cooperate. We are his vessels. There's a story told of a missionary named George Gordon of the 19th century. He was sent to India as a missionary, and he made friends over there with a the Hindu tribe leader. And he asked him, will you teach me your language? And the Hindu, um, the Hindu tribe leader, after building a relationship with him over a couple years, said, I'm not going to teach you because you'll make me a Christian. And he says, no, 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 I really, I just want to learn the language in order to minister to people. And he says, George, I'm not going to teach you because no man can live with you and not become a Christian. The mission of Jesus continues in Franklin, to India, to the nations of the world because of the testimony of the church. Finally, verses 9 through 11, Jesus continues his kingdom through his promised return. He reveals himself. He reminds them of the message. He reveals himself. He commissions them. Then to their amazement, I mean, he's just taken up into heaven. Uh, he just starts going to heaven. I mean, can you imagine the sight? I mean, this is the one passage in all scripture. It's given one scripture, we're given one passage of the ascension of Jesus Think about all the passages we're given about the crucifixion and resurrection. But this is the one passage. I mean, the disciples are just utterly shocked. Like, what is happening? Like, he was just talking, and now all of a sudden he's surrounded by a cloud, and he's just floating. Where's he going? And two angels, they show up, and they give orientation. Here's what's happening. This for the disciples would kind of be like what some of us experienced on Monday, right? Watching the eclipse. I mean, just utter shock, awe, amazement, beauty, almost worshipful for some, right? We, re we rearranged our lives. We traveled. We got kids out of school. We, we missed work and all. Of, it's beautiful. It's all good. And it's all. It's all good. But it's similar to that. We're just looking up in the sky going, what is happening? NPR actually interviewed someone this week. And this is how a witness of uh, watching the clip described it. Uh, the woman said, it was so weird, but it was also otherworldly. Because there was darkness and there was light at the same time. Fighting for my attention. And it was probably the closest I've been to having a spiritual experience. I mean, is that just not the, one of the best metaphors to understand what's going on in the, the battle of the kingdom of light versus the kingdom of darkness fighting for the attention of the human heart? That's what's happening. And I'm curious, if you witnessed the eclipse on Monday, you were probably a little awestruck. I was. I mean, it, it's, it's a supernatural phenomenon of God. And maybe you were a little awestruck, and I bet you testified to others about it. I bet you told others about your experience. And what I really want to ask you to reflect on is could you testify to others about Jesus as you did the eclipse? And I'm the first one to say I could do a better job. By the grace of God, I'm asking him that I'll be a better witness of Jesus than of his creation. And what if we did? Will you join me in that prayer? The angels finally speak. They say, this same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven... So he's, the angels say, Jesus, he's going to heaven, and he's going to come back. And it's also the guiding motive that you and I have until Jesus returns. We don't know. The Bible does not clarify. Jesus himself says, I don't know when the Father will send me back, 
But in the meantime, serve me and testify about me. That's the message in the commission of every follower of Christ. In the meantime, I am coming back. Share me with others. And I will be with you by the power of my spirit. Jesus, he's provided everything for his continued advance as we close. For his message, for his kingdom to advance. He's promised the message will continue. He's provided the eyewitnesses of his teaching, the apostles that established the church by the power of God's spirit. They heard him, they saw him, they touched him. God wrote a book and gave it to us called the scripture. He's provided the Holy Spirit as the power source to bring change of the human heart. He's provided his church, his people, you, me, believers around the world to witness. He's provided his promise to return, which is the hope that we all cling to. He has promised to be with you to the end of the age. He is going before you. He's going before his church. His grace is sufficient. His grace is powerful. And he's asking you to join him in his mission. Let's pray. Father, I thank you how your word, it is challenging. It is comforting. It is convicting. And it is restoring. It never returns void or emptiness. And Father, we ask that you would bless. Bless this church with the power of your spirit to go before us. That we rest, that your spirit is advancing your kingdom through the means that you have given your church and the family and our individual hearts. And Lord, we ask that you would also send out your people and we ask that you would send Jesus back to make all things new and in the meantime equip us to witness and testify to the glorious good of your gospel and your grace Jesus we ask this in your name Amen
come to a time of the Lord's Supper, and if you are serving, dismissing, ask that you would now come to the table, prepare the elements. We come now that Jesus has prepared a meal for his church. His kingdom advances also through the meal of grace that he has given his church, and he wants us to experience his gospel in all the sensory ways. We listen to it, we hear it, and we also get to taste it. The anticipation of his kingdom being restored. And where we drink of this juice and where we eat of this bread, there is a mysterious nourishment of our souls by faith through the power of the Holy Spirit where his grace is coming somehow mysteriously and feeding us on his gospel. It may strengthen our faith. It may deepen our longing for home. It may deepen the longing to pray, Jesus, come back. Bring your advance, bring your kingdom to fulfillment. Ultimately, the redemptive benefits of Christ are being given to us as we come with faith. So if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, you're welcome to this table. Come with an open heart. Come with a humble spirit. But come and feast on Jesus. And if you are visiting with us this morning or just not yet a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask that you just witness this meal. Refrain from participating in it. And our ask of you is to consider the gospel message of Jesus that you heard this morning. Come and talk to myself. Come and talk to Randy. We just want to walk with you. We want to answer your questions. And you are welcome here to ask your questions and to hear the grace of the gospel. We practice communion family style, which means ushers will direct you to the table where there will be a blessing at the table, and there will also be, well, we'll take it together, and then you'll return to your seats the opposite way. As we prepare our hearts to come to to the table, let's corporately pray this confession together, and I'll leave a few moments of private reflection between you, you and the Lord, and then we will hear the assurance of pardon. Let's pray this together. Jesus. Though our sins are vast in number, you are more than adequate for our relief. As our recreator, you have provided all that is necessary for our salvation. Though our guilt rises to condemn us, your righteousness soars above it to plead on our behalf. We are so thankful for your sacrificial love. Father Jesus, Holy Spirit, hear the private Confessions of your people. Father, 
Father, we thank you how your mercy is more. Your grace is sufficient. And Father, hear our prayers. In Jesus, your name we ask. Amen. We give an assurance of pardon because where there is confession, Scripture testifies there is grace. So hear this assurance, the promise that you have been forgiven. Paul writes, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Amen? Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. The gifts of God for the people of God. These are the elements that the Lord Jesus instituted on the night that he was portrayed, representing visible elements of our invisible and eternal reality and union to Christ. Because on the night he was portrayed, after giving thanks, he took the bread and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He also took the cup. He, after giving thanks, he poured the wine. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you in the forgiveness of sins now and forever. Do this in remembrance of me. And we eat of this bread and we drink of this juice. We are proclaiming the kingdom of God here and now and in its return. This meal brings our life together as individuals as well as our eternal union as the church with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you set aside these very simple elements for your spiritual and sacred purposes. We ask all this, Jesus, in your name. Amen. You are, to, you are uh, invited to the tables as you are dismissed. Shattered by the fall, broken and forgotten, feeling lost and all alone. Summoned by the kings to his master's court, lifted by the Savior, cradled in his arms. Don't be long Carry to the table Swept away by his love And I don't see my brokenness anymore When I'm seated at the table Lord, carry to the table, the table of the Lord. Fighting thoughts of fear, wondering why you called my name. Am I good enough to share this cup? This world has left me lame. calls my name in his holy presence I'm healing on a shame so carry to the table see where I don't belong carry to the table to wave I
table Sitting where I don't belong Carry to the table Swept away by his love And I don't see my brokenness anymore When I'm seated at the table Lord, carry me to the table
just like our gracious King Jesus to take our lives and sweep them up into his bigger story, to take our self-interest and make it a part of his kingdom and his mission. And just like the disciples who felt like they needed empowered and they needed more than they had, we can feel that way when it comes to the offering, right? We only have a small amount to give. But in the same way that Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to empower us, God joins the resources that we have to his infinite resources and accomplishes big things with them for the kingdom, which is why Christians give with so much joy whatever it is we have to give. So if you choose to give this morning, you have several options that are listed on the screen behind me. The easiest one is to drop off a gift in the boxes, which are right next to the doors. I get a lot of questions about them because they're small and tasteful, but you'll see them right next to the exits on your way out. Um, Would you join me as we pray for the offering this morning? Father, we pray for open eyes eyes to see how you've provided for us, eyes to see those you want to provide for through us. Most of all, give us a vision for what it looks like when your kingdom comes, and then move us to invest in that reality. We offer you these gifts and ask for your wisdom to use them according to your will. Amen. There are a few things going on this week at Christ Community that we want you to know about. The first one is a big one because it's the annual Mustard Seed Silent Auction and Art Show. You may not know that 168 preschoolers gather on our campus every week, and you want to talk about a place where people are learning about the kingdom and then being deployed, talk to a Mustard Seed student. And Mustard Seed, from its very beginning, has been committed to making sure that financial need doesn't keep students from being able to attend. So 100% of the proceeds from the silent auction go towards scholarships for students. There are a lot of fun things to bid on. Personally, I've put in a bid for the rec center, for a pass to the rec center, because it's close to my office. Uh, but there's lots of neat things. So make sure that you look at the back of your bulletin and use the QR code to check into the silent auction, or you can stop by the nursery welcome area and actually see the items up for bid this morning. The second opportunity we want to let you know about is our spring work day, which is next Saturday. One of the things that I have learned in my role as executive director is just what it takes to maintain a building and grounds the size of this one. We are so blessed, but it takes a lot to maintain it. So we hope that you'll come out next, week, next Saturday and join us. This is a great opportunity to meet new people. If you're wanting to make community, you know, meet other people and build community here. If you're looking for an opportunity to serve as a family, this is a great option. So go to the website. There's a sign up genius and you can... Let us know that you're going to be there because there'll be coffee and donuts and juice, and we want to make sure that you've got a job and a donut waiting for you. As we prepare to leave this morning, you may be sensing a need for prayer in your heart, and we just want you to know that there'll be elders down front after the service and others who would love to pray with you. So please don't feel like you have to carry things alone. There are people here who want to pray with and for you. Would you stand now and join me for our benediction in song? Bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you.
You are loved and you are liked. Go in peace. Have a great week.